this last worksheet, number three, in this area of GCOC 11, about quadrilaterals and their properties, just ask you to attempt some explana uh, to explain some proof about why certain properties exist and not just use them or know them. And I guess I propose to you that there are a couple of ways to do that. And uh, I'm going to show you kind of three lines of thought. Uh, I'm not going to, again, do them all formally here for you. That's something to establish yourself. But uh, let's give it a shot here. Uh, the first way I, I want to prove this one is what I'd call symmetry. In GCOA3, you and I established the symmetries of the quadrilaterals. And we learned that uh, a rhombus has a rotational symmetry of 2. What that means is that if I rotate this guy, let me put in my uh, diagonals, if I rotate this rhombus, A will map onto C, D onto B, and so on. Um, let me put a little E here. Is that if I do this rotation, this must map onto this. Again, working some logical ideas. That rotation of 180 degrees, that symmetry order of 2, tells me that that has to map onto that. It has to. That's what symmetry means. It would also mean that this diagonal here in a rotation of 180 would map onto this right here. This would be one way, again, I would write it out in more specifics and detail, but to explain the, the property of a rotational symmetry order 2 would mean that that mapping would have to take place. Second way, um, let's use um, congruence. So what we might do here, let's use uh, triangle congruence. What you would attempt to do here is I would maybe try to show that these two triangles are congruent. And if I could do that, then that piece would have to equal that piece. And this isn't that hard. Um, this has to be um, equal to this because they're a rhombus. There's a common side right here. And I'm aware that, um, and depends on what I want to use here, um, I'm aware that um, the diagonals are perpendicular to each other. And so I could use that um, to prove by HL that this is congruent to this. And now I can speak to CPCTC, which says that would make that equal to that. I could repeat a very similar process to uh, prove that this one is identical to this one, and so on. Um, another way to do it, of course, would be a transformational way. And I think a, a reflection would be a great way to do this. Um, basically, you could talk about the mapping of B to itself, of D to itself that A would have to map to C because that, that this is perpendicular and in the middle, a perpendicular bisector, and that would force AE to map onto CE and BE to map onto DE. These again are just some general ideas. This isn't uh, all of the ideas of this particular worksheet. But this is how I want you to think about it. Are there things that you've learned and developed about these shapes that would help you to make an argument either through symmetry or congruence or through transformations that would help you to express why you know the properties of these shapes exist? Good luck with it. Just to show you a specific example like the one I just did on the board, here's another one that just says given a parallelogram, so I know it's a parallelogram prove that opposite angles are. Now, again, you kind of have three approaches here. You could use a symmetry approach. Uh, you could use triangles uh, being congruent. That would be an approach. Or you could do a transformational approach. If you're thinking symmetry, you know that it ha this uh, parallelogram has rotational symmetry order of two means it maps onto itself at 180. And so I know that B would map to D, 
and D would map to B. I know A would map to C, and so we would get a mapping of this angle exactly onto that angle, because that's how symmetry works. If, if you tell me it, has, uh, it maps onto itself in that amount, then I know that they would land on each other, and these would have to. If you wanted to, you could also create this and start talking about that these are congruent triangles. This isn't that difficult either. There would be a common side. And using the parallel lines, you could talk about an alternate interior here and here, and an alternate interior here and here, and establish a nice little congruence. You could also talk about just doing a rotation of 180 degrees and looking at who maps to who and so on, another way to do it. Um, often our, our end of course exams and other things ask for uh, a, a two column look as well. And so uh, how would you know this proceed? In a similar way, um, if we wanted to do the more formal approach, you might say, let's see, they want us to prove the angles. I might say that uh, AB uh, is parallel to CD and that BC is parallel to AD. Both of those are the definition of a parallelogram. I'm going a little bit fast here, uh, a little messy. Uh, how do you like my parallelogram shortened form? Maybe you don't like it. Um, and then uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is this angle here would equal this one. So angle ABD is congruent to angle CDB. Uh, parallel lines give us alternate interior angles that are congruent. I could also state that this angle, angle CBD, is congruent to this angle, angle ADB. For the same reason, alternate interior angles are congruent. Finally, I need a side. There's a beautiful little side there. It's a reflexive side. BD exists in both triangles. That's called the reflexive property. Often in uh, shortened form, we call that a common side. And then I now can say triangle ABD is indeed congruent to triangle CDB. And I would use angle side angle. Once you've established they're congruent, then we can say, ah, because of that, I know A has to be the same as C, and B has to be the same as D. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent, just like that.